So we're gonna keep this moving right along. Our third chair will be filled, I promise. Um, but in the interest of time, there we go, right here. No, you're, you're bypassing me right there. <laughs> All right, um, so I'm gonna uh, introduce each of the speakers one at a time, uh, since we have three of them, and that way you don't have to worry about remembering who's who. Uh, but because of the bio, the full bios are available, these are gonna be very, very brief introductions. And so our first speaker uh, in this panel, which is on uh, long-term um, uh, prospects for carbon capture, and sequestration. Uh, our first speaker is uh, Howard Herzog, who is a senior research engineer here at MIT in the Energy Initiative, and also executive director of the Carbon Capture Utilization and Storage Center, which is one of our uh, low carbon energy centers within MITEI. Howard. Okay, thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, if I <clears throat> get my slide deck up, and also if you can reset the clock. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, Ernie's gonna really be on my case here. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, uh, this first slide, please. There we go. Okay, so I'm gonna be talking about carbon capture's uh, role in uh, deep decarbonization. Uh, about 30% of our uh, greenhouse gas emissions can be uh, classified as uh, difficult to eliminate. And of course, we're gonna get to deep carbonization, so we gotta get to net zero, which means we have to eliminate uh, these emissions. And uh, carbon capture and storage is one way we can uh, uh, address a lot of these emissions. Now, what do I mean by carbon capture? I'm gonna talk about two flavors uh, today. The first is from large stationary sources. You can do it from power plants, but then I'm gonna talk mainly about industrial industrial plants uh, where you scrub the flue gas. Uh, we do this with uh, a chemical sorbent that uh, uh, grabs the CO2 out of the flue gas, then we regenerate the absorbent to release the CO2 and uh, put the sorbent back in um, uh, to get, catch some more CO2. The second way we can do it is uh, capturing it uh, from the air, and I'll go into more details on, on how they do that. One method is through, once again, through chemical absorption, but another method is through biological. And uh, these are the four topics I'm gonna talk about, and we'll go one at a time here. So let's start with industry. Uh, the seven largest industries is uh, responsible for about 20% of our uh, CO2 emissions worldwide. Uh, this includes cement and iron and steel. Uh, why, and this is gonna be growing, it's probably gonna grow about 35% projection over the next 30 years. So why is this hard to uh, decarbonize a lot of these? Well, especially, uh, we'll take cement and iron uh, here, is that a lot of the emissions, CO2 emissions coming out, are not from energy. So you can't just replace the energy source. They're coming from the process. In terms of cement, it's the calcining of uh, limestone. In, in, the, in terms of, um, Steel is the reduction of iron ore with, uh, with carbon. And so therefore, uh, putting uh, uh, carbon capture at the end of the process lets us uh, get to this. We could decarbonize uh, some of the fuels. Uh, it's not it's so trivial that you just put, say, hydrogen in instead of uh, uh, coal or gas. Uh, it takes some uh, doing, but that can do get you some of the way, but not all of the way. Um, there are people looking at uh, sort of uh, carbon-free processes. Uh, here at MIT, uh, Professor Don Sadaway is looking at uh, electrochemical uh, reduction of iron uh, uh, to produce steel so we don't have to use uh, uh, the carbon there. Uh, but these, uh, but that's longer term, and CCS is available today, so uh, at least as a start, we can do that while some of these other processes are being developed uh, in the longer term, because they'll take a while, not just a while to develop, but even when they're developed, they'll take quite a bit of time to diffuse uh, throughout the world. Next, I want to talk about. Whoops. Next, I want to talk about hydrogen. Uh, Frank's done a pretty good job, so I don't think I have to introduce uh, blue hydrogen. Uh, that's basically steam methane reforming with uh, carbon capture and storage. Uh, it's about a four to one ratio today between uh, green hydrogen and gray hydrogen. Uh, it's still over a two to one ratio today uh, with uh, blue hydrogen to, to green hydrogen. So, uh, as we heard in the previous uh, talk, there's a lot of infrastructure to build up with hydrogen while we're waiting for electrolyzers to come down in cost, we're waiting for the electricity system to decarbonize, we can use low carbon hydrogen today to get the systems uh, uh, moving because they exist. We have two big demonstrations of both at a million tons per year of uh, producing uh, blue hydrogen. 
Uh, one of them is at um, uh, Port Arthur, Texas by uh, Air Products. And this is a uh, picture of it. And if you look at the uh, left-hand part of the screen, those uh, series of vessels there are, are vacuum swing adsorption columns where the uh, CO2 is captured uh, from this plant. And once again, we're doing this at a level of a, of a million tons a year. So th these are some examples and maybe eventually we have the greener technologies come in, you know, with, with green hydrogen or, or, or carbon-free processing, but this is available today and we don't have, you know, we really need to get started immediately and this will give us an advantage to do that. Um, now let me talk about capturing from the air. I'm going to start with direct air capture, which uses um, similar fundamental technologies of, of using scrubbing to get the CO2 uh, out of the air. Um, now, direct air capture is a very seductive uh, concept. If we could do that, we can keep putting CO2 out just like we do today and not worry about it. Have somebody else clean it up over here with their uh, direct air capture machines. It's not that easy. Um, the, first of all, the question is not whether we can get the CO2 out of the air. We know we can do it. We do it today. We do it in spacecraft. We do it on submarines. Um, so we can do it. The real question is, what's the cost? And lately, there's been a number of argue, uh, articles out there, uh, even in peer-reviewed journals, that said, well, we can do it for $200 a ton. And then somebody says, no, we can do it for $100 a ton of CO2. And then somebody says, no, we can even do it for less than that. Don't believe them. Um, I've done some work on it. I give a reference to a paper here. Um, first of all, when we talk about dollars per ton of CO2, you got to know what you're talking about. You got to be talking about net CO2. So any CO2 you release in, in, in the process to capture the CO2, you have to subtract off. So first, let's say we're talking about dollars per net ton of CO2. And I will, I will um, claim that the price of uh, capturing from the air today uh, in dollars per net ton of CO2 is closer to $1,000 than it is to $100. You can go on the website from one of the uh, vendors, Climeworks, and you can actually buy um, offsets for your plane travel. And the cost they're charging is $1,100 per ton of CO2. The the reason that uh, this is expensive, or there's two reasons. One is thermodynamics. Uh, you're capturing from a very, very dilute stream. The concentration of CO2 in the air is 300 times less than it is at a, a coal-fired power plant. That means the minimum work to capture is more, and that's going to cost more energy. Uh, but another reason is you're going to have to process 300 times more air to get that. And so what does this mean? So up here on the uh, right-hand side in the circle is the absorber column from a um, carbon capture plant. This is a plant down in Texas, Petronova, and it's capturing 1.6 million tons of CO2 a day. Um, and, it, on the left is the uh, is a as a commercial unit from Climeworks, the ones that are selling it for eleven hundred dollars per ton of CO two, and that is nine hundred nine hundred tons per year. So, uh, if you want to do the same capture from the air as we're doing at the uh, coal fire power plant, you'll need eighteen hundred of those units. So the scale here is really uh, daunting. I want to talk about it in a little different way. Um, this is a, um, uh, uh, the cross-section area, let me go back. So, whoops. So when I talk about cross-sectional area, if you look at the direct air capture unit, that face that you see, that's the cross-sectional area where all those uh, fans are. So we can calculate uh, how much cross-sectional area we need uh, for direct air capture um, if we know how much percent we take out of the air and, and the speed that we're putting it through the, uh, the contactor. In the case of Carbon Engineering, another company that does direct air capture, they use 1.4 meters per second, 75% capture. So they have 47,000 square meters across sectional area. And that just to catch 1 million tons of CO2. And the assumption is we're running this 90% of the time. So that's just 1 million tons. Well, what's 47,000 square meters? Well, if you take something 10 meters high, about a three-story building, then that's almost three miles long. 
Where do you put a unit like that? Well, it's been suggested to me to put it on the U.S.-Mexican border, but... <laughs> And, and if we actually did the full, full 2,000, close to 2,000 miles of the border, we can capture about 700 million tons. But 700 million tons, while it's a lot, is still less than 15% of the CO2 we put out in our systems today. So realistically, what you need to do is you need to divide it up and, and, and have farms, just like you have wind farms. You have to be careful not to put one unit, in, you know, windmill in, in, in the wind shadow of another. Here, you don't want the depleted air, the, from one unit going into another. So for a million tons per year, it could be any, it could be a, a kilom square kilometer or even bigger to do that. And then you have to pipe up all these units and that is money. And I think uh, people are gonna be surprised when they actually try to do these systems, um, how much money that's gonna be. Uh, I, have, I have a history of, in process engineering and the people always underestimate those costs in these systems. So that's all I'm gonna say on direct air capture. I'm gonna go on to bioenergy with carbon capture and storage. And this one, I'm actually quite optimistic about. Uh, what this does is the biomass removes the CO2 from the air, so we don't need any absorbers. Of course, you need a lot of land area for the biomass to do it. Um, but then you, you burn the biomass in a power plant and uh, capture the CO2. Uh, when you do direct air capture, you need a lot of energy uh, for bioenergy in CCS, the energy is all provided by the biomass and you have energy left over to produce uh, electricity. It uses the same technology that's been demonstrated at power plants, what we just saw at the Petronova plant. Uh, what it does require is a sustainable supply of biomass, and that's a big question, how much is available uh, uh, as we go forward. Uh, but I think, and I think that's uh, um, gonna be very important. So that's uh, um, the, uh, sort of uh, how this works. We've done some modeling here at MIT uh, using the EPA model from our, from our joint program on, on the science and policy of climate change. And I've been working with them and, and we we're gonna put out a paper and we looked at all the technical and economic uh, of the entire chain from the, uh, the, the land uh, acquisition to the, to the um, uh, biomass growth and transportation through the biomass conversion to electricity uh, to the carbon capture and storage and we've also included uh, emissions associated with land use change both direct and indirect emissions and what we come out with is a graph that looks like this uh, with this is showing carbon price going into the future the blue line uh, up there is uh, the scenario we ran without bioenergy and CCS, and you see the price going up in 2100 to over $2,000 a ton of CO2. Uh, this is being driven by those hard to eliminate emissions and, and the expenses that, that would do if we didn't have offsets for them. Uh, if we run this with bi bioenergy and CCS, uh, we cap out at about $240 per ton of CO2. So this is quite a major impact if we can actually do it. As you see with the uh, note there in red, uh, ecosystem impacts and, and social acceptability, which uh, you really can't put in these models, um, could limit and probably will limit some of this deployment. But even if we get uh, a fraction of this, it's gonna be a great benefit. So what our model says, uh, we can do is we'll get 30 exajoules in 2050, going up to 320 in 2100. Today, the world's energy system uses about 600 exajoule. So there's not that much in 2050. You see most of it in the second half of the century. We're gonna generate 21 gigatons of CO2 negative emissions. That's a little over half of our uh, CO2 coming out uh, today. And a lot of people worry about the impact on food prices. Our modeling shows that we're gonna get a fairly modest food price increase of only about uh, 5%. Of course, we're making some um, assumptions about productivity of the um, of, of biomass growth and also of, uh, of food production uh, as we go out uh, into the future. But we're, we're making those assumptions based on past history, whether that's going to pan out or not, uh, we're not sure. And I should say the biomass we can use can be woody biomass, but also can be herbaceous biomass and will probably be a, a combination of the two. So that's basically uh, my message is today, I do want to just say if you're interested in the subject, more carbon capture. Um, um, I wrote a book about a year ago. Um, 
published by MIT Press, and it talks about these topics in more detail as well as uh, other topics. And then the question, of course, comes, what are we gonna do with the CO2? And I'm gonna turn it over to Ruben for that. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so our next uh, panelist is Professor Ruben Wanis. Um, he is a professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering here at MIT. Uh, he's a geoscientist by training, and among his many uh, research interests is geological carbon sequestration. Thank you, Chris. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I've been looking forward to this uh, set of uh, panels for uh, quite some time now. And as uh, Howard already anticipated, um, the question that we'll be alluding to uh, for the next 10 or 15 minutes is um, how do we uh, store the CO2 in the geologic medium for long periods of time? Uh, periods of time, there seems to be some echo. Is there an echo for the audience as well or just for me? I'll is it better now? Um, so I'll be discussing uh, technological aspects, uh, capacity aspects, and public safety aspects of geological CO2 storage. So just to set the stage, uh, what do we mean by carbon capture, utilization, or storage? So the uh, uh, chain starts with CO2 capture, which uh, Howard Herzog just described. That is the separation and compression of the CO2. Then the transport, typically via a dedicated pipeline and then ultimately the injection for long-term geologic storage. And one can already think of different uh, options in the subsurface where this could take place. So perhaps um, a, an obvious choice would be mature or depleted oil and gas reservoirs for a number of reasons. So if the oil and gas, which are buoyant fluids, um, are there, uh, means that there's a seal already in the, in the geologic uh, reservoir that um, has proven to be effective over millions of years. Uh, there could be also an advantage to storing CO2 there in the form of offsets uh, uh, to the cost of the infrastructure. There would be other options, including uh, unminable coal seams, but the physics of how the uh, storage would work there uh, are sort of co complicated, and uh, there would be a tendency to, um, for CO2 to leak more so than in other formations. And the uh, geologic formations that I'll be paying most of the attention to are deep saline aquifers. And the reason is, the very basic reason is that um, they are ubiquitous. And as I will make a point of in this presentation, um, they provide a gigantic capacity that uh, could address the needs for deployment of this technology at the scale that is actually needed. So just a word, what do you mean by deep? Because deep is a very loose or relative concept. Deep means a depth of one kilometer or more. And the reason is that under those conditions, the CO2 is a supercritical fluid that is a dense gas, which is uh, what you need for effective storage. And what do I mean by saline? Uh, saline aquifer means that the, uh, also sort of a relative loose concept, uh, what I mean is, um, a brackish formation where the brine has a salinity that is many times larger than seawater. Could be 10, 100, or 1,000 times or more um, saline than seawater. So it would never, of course, be used for drinking water purposes. So this, I would like to sort of frame the, the discussion that's to follow as to what is the role that CCUS can play? So I think we have, we need some clarity. So CCUS cannot be seen as the ultimate end game solution. It simply is not. So the end game solution is a yet to be determined low carbon energy system. The question is, um, how do we get there? Energy systems have inertia, a lot of inertia as it turns out, and uh, we need is to deploy solutions at a scale that we will discuss in a moment in a rapid fashion. So it is in that sense that the CCUS can play a role in uh, mitigating climate change. And this has been recognized in, in our own work and in the work is a very nice uh, uh, summary paper that our third panelist, uh, Arun Majumdar, in collaboration with John Deutsch, uh, just put out in the journal Joule last year. 
In particular, as um, Howard Herzog, our previous panelist, has pointed out, CCUS uh, plays a role not only by itself, but also as an enabling technology for other climate change technologies, including BEATS or direct air capture with CCS. This has been recognized and very nicely summarized in a report um, published by the European Academy of Sciences last year or two years ago. And um, I would like to give a, another piece of information before we uh, turn into sort of more visual aspects of the problem. And that is, so really, what is the scale that we're talking about? And no, we, I think we know it's a gigantic scale, actually the gigaton scale. If we look at the world, man-made world CO2 emissions, they are in the order of 11 or 12 billion metric tons. That's 11 gigatons of carbon equivalent per year. Um, much of that comes from coal-fired and gas-fired power plants, let's say a third of that, uh, four gigatons of carbon equivalent per year. So let's take a fourth of that as our unit, one gigaton of carbon equivalent per year. You can multiply by 44 divided by 12, that would give you the uh, CO2 equivalent, so that's 3.7 gigatons per year. So that's 3.7 times 10 to the 12 kilograms per year, which really doesn't mean much to me, and probably wouldn't to many of you. So let's try to make it more um, understandable. Um, so we can divide by the density that compressed CO2 would have deep in the subsurface at this uh, depth of one kilometer or more. And that would be about half the density of water, 500 kilograms per cubic meter. So that's about seven times 10 to the nine cubic meters per year. Still doesn't mean anything to me. So to wrap our arms literally around what that means, let's convert that to barrels per day. So one cubic meter is about six uh, barrels and a year has 365 days. So that gives us a volumetric flow rate, a volumetric rate of over 100 million barrels of compressed CO2 per day. So we know that um, we can move things around the globe in that scale. So about 80 million barrels of oil are uh, uh, produced and distributed around the world every day. But this would be at, at around that scale. Okay? So this plays a role not only for carbon capture and storage, but for any other mitigation technology. If you're going to grow algae, no, this is the scale that one should be worrying about. Um, there is a, a number of success stories. Perhaps the most prominent is uh, uh, the, the carbon capture and storage um, project in the North Sea, in the Norwegian North Sea, uh, the Sleipner project, which um, has been in operation for about three decades, injecting at one megaton of CO2 per year. So if we think of uh, forecasting, or if we allow ourselves, say, 50 years to deploy this technology, that means that we have to put in place 3,500 Sleipners, and in 50 years, that's 2,500 weeks. So we need to deploy about one to two Sleipners per week. But we've deployed one in three decades, right? So that's the good news. <laughs> the bad news is that that's just to solve 10% of the problem, right? That's one gigaton of carbon instead of 11 or 12. Um, okay. So on that uh, note, let's uh, now think of how this can actually work. And uh, very quickly, you realize that to operate at that scale, there has to be a concerted effort to inject in the subsurface that would affect the subsurface at the geologic scale, at the hundreds of kilometers uh, scale. So one has to think of entire geologic basins where this would uh, occur. And the CO2 being a buoyant fluid, even if dense, but a buoyant fluid, would tend to migrate up dip in these geologic formations. And then interesting physics take place. And that is what uh, my group and others uh, study. There are mechanisms that act in the direction of trapping the CO2 and immobilize it in the subsurface. One of them is as the plume is migrating, capillary forces will dislodge a gigantic plume into small blobs, ganglia, that are then trapped in the pore space, in the rock. And as the CO2 moves, gets in contact with brine. And the dissolubility is low, maybe one or two percent, but enough to make the brine slightly denser. And as that happens, 
then we have a layer of dense brine on top of less dense brine, and that turns a convection cell that greatly accelerates the dissolution. And you may or may not be interested in that process, but uh, one should be interested in what is the impact on the large-scale migration of CO2. So I invite you to take a look at this you know, bench, uh, bench top experiment in which we use analog fluids, but there at the bottom of the slide you will see a, a buoyant fluid that is going to start running up the slope, and as it does so, it gets in contact with the fluid below, which is denser, and as the two fluids mix, the mixture is denser than either fluid, and uh, the overall effect is that that is a very powerful mechanism to stop to consume the migrating CO2 plume and uh, uh, limit its migration in the geologic medium. So we can now use sort of these physics to better understand how much CO2 can actually be stored underground at the geologic basin scale. And there are two uh, aspects to this problem. One is how far the CO2 will migrate. The other one is how much the pressure is going to increase as a result of injection. And there's an important concept here in that how much we can inject will depend on how much we give ourselves to inject. If we give ourselves one minute, not much can be injected without pressurizing, uh, overpressurizing the entire reservoir. If we give ourselves 100 years, cumulatively, cumulatively, much more CO2 can be injected. So that's why you see there a graph that shows that the capacity depends on how much time you're allowed or you give yourself to inject. We've applied this uh, quite carefully to you know, a variety of geologic basins in the United States to gain an understanding of over time for a given injection duration, how much uh, storage capacity can be activated. So that's one half of the story. The other one, so that is the uh, supply side of the story, then there's the demand side of the story. We can think of CCS once again as a bridge technology, a bridge that will have a duration, and it will have a rate of uh, deployment and then a rate of phase out. So now we, we can see the problem in a way that an economics person would see it. We can over time provide storage space but there's a demand for it, and the demand curve is convex. The supply curve is concave. Those two curves are going to cross at some point. So a legitimate question is, are they going to cross in a year from now or in a thousand years from now? So our analysis you know, uh, indicates that even just looking at, the, uh, at a small subset of the geologic basins, for instance, in the US, um, this would be a a viable climate change mitigation technology over centuries, at the century timescale or longer. Um, we published uh, those results, this was a number of years ago, and uh, the same journal, same year, uh, Mark Zovac and uh, Steve Gorelick published another paper, I would say more of a position statement, where they declared, this is the uh, last sentence of their abstract, this is a risky and likely unsuccessful strategy for significantly reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And their point was that well, there would be a risk of inducing earthquakes, and inducing earthquakes would lead to leakage along faults. So they articulated what is a, a, a important, but also well-known concern, and that is CCS, as many other strategies, or many other subsurface technologies, can induce seismicity. But their characterization was, a, in uh, my opinion, our opinion, a big misrepresentation of how it actually affect or how it would be relevant to CCS. For the most part, because um, uh, having false slip doesn't mean that the fluids will leak. And one good country example is all the oil and gas reservoirs in California, a highly active tectonic region where the buoyant fluids have stayed in place for millions of years. Um, but it did point, I think, uh, an, a to, to an important aspect of the problem, pro very important geologic or technical aspect. And that is that site selection is key, and one should be looking at uh, uh, geologic formations that are away from brittle rocks, away from the crystalline basement, and um, that would be uh, the, the, the starting point for uh, initiating the exploration. So I will uh, summarize uh, the uh, key points by saying that 
we have to understand storage capacity as something that is dynamic. It depends on how long that bridge is. We cannot just give, oh, this geologic basin has a storage capacity of 10 gigatons. That doesn't really make sense. And that should be incorporated into a poly policy aspects. Site selection is key. We should be looking for soft sedimentary rocks away from crystalline basement. There's an aspect that I have not had time to discuss, but critically important, and that is we have to build um, we have to build confidence that the operations are done in the way that they should be done, and that comes with a multidisciplinary monitoring, time-lapse 3D seismic, pressure monitoring, composition uh, monitoring, uh, perhaps micro-seismic monitoring. And in terms of R&D, I would say that right now, what is perhaps more critical is to better understand the behavior of geologic faults, both from a frictional point of view and a hydraulic conductance point of view. And the way to improve that knowledge would be, perhaps ultimately, with um, field demonstrations that have different risk profiles. And by that, I'm going to be a little controversial here. I mean, we ought to be able to have a portfolio of field demonstrations where we can point to one and say, this one will fail, and it will fail at this rate and for this reason. And it is that that will build the knowledge or allow us to build the knowledge that we need. And all that being said, I think that there should be, if we want to, um, if we want to really make good on our efforts for climate change mitigation, we need that bridge to the very cool, very low carbon energy systems that await us, um, but um, we cannot wait for it. So with that, I will stop. Thank you. And our last uh, speaker in this panel is uh, Arun Majumdar, who was previously, in previously introduced by Secretary Moniz. Uh, he is visiting us from Stanford, where he is the J. Precourt Provostial Chair Professor in the Departments of Mechanical Engineering and Material Science and Engineering and Co-Director of the Precourt Institute for Energy. Uh, and I'll reiterate what uh, was said before, is that he's also uh, known as the founding director of the uh, DOE's Advanced Research Projects Agency Energy, also known as ARPA-E. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Ernie, for inviting me. Um, it's really always a pleasure to come here um, and just be inspired by some of the talks that we just heard. Um, there are three things I want you to take away from what I'm going to say. Three words. One is scale. I think uh, Ruben, you already alluded to that. The second is speed or urgency. And the third is options. What options do we have? But it's late in the evening. And I guess I'm the last talk. So I'm going to start as a regular professor does. I'm going to have, I'm going to throw two quizzes at you. OK? Number one, question number one. If you add up the weight of all the human beings on this world, 7.7 .7 billion, what is the total weight in gigatons? Quick. Anyone? It's, let me give you the answers. It's half a gigaton. OK? The weight of all the human beings on this world is half a gigaton. Now the second quiz is coming. It's a little more complicated. The second pop quiz is the following. I'm going to throw numbers at you, and I want you to guess the units, OK? One. <laughs> Perfect, yes. One degree Celsius. This is the roughly, it's 1.2 global average temperature rise from the pre-industrial stage. It's about one. And we are seeing now the effects of the extreme weather conditions, et cetera, and all the effects of that. The second number is two. You can well guess. This is two degrees. This is the Paris Agreement. I don't know if Secretary Kerry is still there. Um, this is the, what we had agreed upon. So it's one degree produced of those extremes, the extremes that we are now seeing. Imagine what two degrees would be. The third number is 800. This is not 800 degrees Celsius. <laughs> if you are, that's right. Venus is actually lower than 800. I checked. This is, if two degrees is the, is the what we really like to do, this is the budget of CO2 that we have left, okay? 
The fourth number is a scary one, is 40. 40 gigatons, roughly 40 gigatons of CO2 per year. And the last number is even more scary, is 20. It's 20 years left. And after that, we have to be zero, if you really want to be below two degrees. This is another fancy way of explaining this chart, basically, <laughs> right? So we have to have negative emissions. We have to look at global carbon management. And so this was the question which I think provoked Secretary Moniz to throw us the, the quiz at the end, six months left in your term. And to look at carbon management, it's important to find out where the carbon comes from globally. And electricity is certainly a big chunk. Transportation, we think, is a big chunk. It's 40%. Food and agriculture is huge. Industry, cement, steel, concrete, petrochemicals, all of this is really big. And if you really want to look at carbon management at a global scale and look for all the options you have, you get a chart like this. This is not a quiz. I don't want you to memorize anything. Because what it says is that if you go from the flow of carbon to where it will be and if you want to close the loop, it is complex. There are many options, the multiple pathways, the science, engineering, economic scale, finance, markets, regulation, supply chain, policy, consequences, all of this. This is a gigaton scale problem and all of this will have to be considered if you really want to manage this. So clearly we, not, we cannot follow each one of them. If you really want to be at the gigaton scale, you do not shoot for the kiloton or the megaton scale. That's not going to cut it. So what is it that has the gigaton scale effect? So this is where this chart is a slightly outdated, but nevertheless gives you the magnitude of the things. This is in gigatons of carbon, not CO2. You've got to multiply that by 3.67 to get to CO2. Nevertheless, it gives you the magnitude. You can see right away that you have nine, or it's actually 11 gigatons of carbon that is uh, emitted by a fossil fuel consumption, cement, and all of that. Look at the number out here on photosynthesis, 120 plus something, okay? And most of it goes back. Only a few percent remains in the ground, okay? Look at the oceans. This is 90 plus something. 90 goes back, two remains. That gives you acidity, uh, acidification of the oceans. So there are massive carbon fluxes that, are, that have been in balance for centuries, now are being imbalanced by this little thing out here. So if you really want to manage this carbon, well, I mean, certainly you want to reduce this and you want to capture it in some way, and that's important, but you also want to leverage what nature has actually given you. And so, so this led to things like that we talked about in this report that we wrote, uh, converting CO2, whoops, um, let me go back, converting CO2 into chemicals and fuels, harnessing the natural biological cycle, and we kept away from the oceans, thinking that that is a, it's, it's, it's kind of complicated. It really want to do things in the ocean where the people acceptance of it, it may be difficult. Um, so if you look at this, then of course carbon capture geolo geological sequestration, this has already been discussed. So let me draw upon a few things that perhaps has not been discussed. Harnessing the natural biological carbon cycle, as I mentioned, we have 120 gigatons of carbon coming in per year. We only keep about a few gigatons um, in the ground, and the rest of it all goes back. And the speed, gigatons per year, is the important thing. It's not only just the capacity, but the rate, because speed is of importance. So if you looked at that, then we said, what needs to be done? Well. There are lots of research questions we frankly have not addressed. Some of it have been addressed, but these are really hard. How do you increase the photosynthetic efficiency? The enzyme Rubisco has to be improved. Oh, well, research has been going on for a while, but this needs continuous research in trying to understand this. One of my favorite ones is how can, and, and Ernie teases me about this one, is how can we grow, develop crops with deeper roots and higher lignin content to increase the soil carbon? 
you know, people grow these mega pumpkins, you know, for these pumpkin in a competition. I want to grow mega carrots. <laughs> okay. I want to put the, the radish deep down inside because if you really look at the soil, the carbon degradation, it goes exponentially down with depth. Okay, so the deeper the roots, and this is where things like CRISPR-Cas9 that people around here talk about could potentially be used, and the agricultural in industry be incentivized to do these kinds of things so that they make money out of it, and that hopefully will get to scale. That's at least one way. Well, this is another one, uh, whoops, you pointed out. This is, look at, the, can we develop seeds and land management for no-till agriculture? Land management, extremely critical because if you till, the carbon goes away, okay? So I won't go into all the details. Please look at that complex report and the summary that John and I wrote for Juul. And there's a, it's a 15 or 20 page report with 80 page appendix, good luck. It's a letter, it was a letter, 80 page letter to you. Second thing about chemicals, and this is, uh, it's already been touched upon, I won't go into too much detail, but two things I want you to take away. Number one is that how can we develop carbon-free, CO2-free exergy? Don't forget heat. Most of the, the chemical industry today is thermochemical. It's not electrochemical. Not that we don't need to develop electrochemical, but if you really want, an, if you want the know-how for scaling, in the industry, that's thermochemical. So I would say exergy to, uh, for at less than $30 a megawatt hour. That's not, you know, we are almost there in terms of solar and wind, in terms of electricity. Let's not forget nuclear heat. This, the second thing is that can we produce carbon-free hydrogen? It's already been discussed at less than $1.50 a kilogram. There are multiple options. Some of them are not quite there. I think you talked about, Frank, about how can we get lower in electrochemistry. Methane pyrolysis. Methane is essentially free today, at least in the North America. Can we use that for, to pyrolyze methane to produce hydrogen and solid carbon? Much easier to handle than CO2. I won't go into too much detail, this has been talked about, but this is, came out from a report that I was part of, I was co-chairing before I went to the Department of Energy for the, the uh, American Physical Society on direct air capture, exactly what you talked about earlier. And what we said is that, look, if you plot, and I won't go too technical, if you plot the rate constant out here and the heat of reaction, the kinetics and the thermodynamics, what you really want is over here, high rate constant, low heat of reaction. And that amounts to low capital cost and lower energy operating cost. But what we have today, at least sorbents, the monoethylene amine, uh, uh, amines, uh, piperazine, et cetera, or hydroxide, highly alkaline to have you know, acid-based reactions, these are all along here. And what you really need out there, and this was about 10 years ago, and since then, frankly, there have been some scientific breakthroughs, and some of them have been things like MOFs. These are cooperative binding. It's almost like a phase transition. You bind CO2 and boom, it goes up. The uptick is not a typical Langmuir isotherm, which is really important. But the problem today is that these things are not stable. So we need to get them at scale. We need to stabilize these. Again, lots of details out here I'm skipping in the interest of time. Finally, this is something we did not have in the report, is methane. And I think this is a sleeper. And we need to really look at methane because the methane concentration is going up. It is a highly stable molecule, much more there, you know, in CO2, there's a quadrupole. This, has, this is very stable. You can't hold on to it. The activation barrier for methane is more than 400 kilojoules per mole. How do you activate it? And this CH1 activation has been the challenge for chemists for I don't know how many decades. Our chemist would know that. So this is a problem, and now although we have seen, and by the way, the radiative forcing, as methane goes out at 80 times more than CO2, and then it degrades a little bit, but if you look at the radiative forcing, it's not quite CO2, but boy, it's, it's scary, okay? And so just last week, there was a paper in Nature that came out that using C14 versus C12, in a fossil doesn't have any C C14, it's all C12 because the half-life of C14 is about 5,800 years. 
So it's all C12. So by monitoring C14 and C12, you can then tell the source of the methane. And what they found is, is mostly from fossil sources. Now, of course, this was last week. I'm sure there'll be other work, whether this is accurate or not, but it highlights the issue that there is methane out there. And frankly, as the permafrost starts warming, there could be more methane going out, which is a tipping point, and that's a forward in you know, a positive feedback, and we really don't know what's gonna happen. None of the climate models really capture this properly. And this is worrisome. And so there have been, uh, you know, this is some of our colleagues at Stanford said that we need to do something. This is just a comment. There's nothing done yet. This is just a comment, we need to do something. And I think we really need to do something about this. And I won't go into the calculations. This may not be as tough, except that the research that is needed is on selective methane sorbents. And I come back to this molecule, which is so stable and symmetric, I don't know how to hold on to it. And so this is a research need. We have to figure out how to get this done. Just to end, before time, I wanna get out of this technical thing and kind of give my impression of the times we're living in. And this goes back, this is from a different age, 50 years ago, but it captures the moment that we're living in, in no uncertain terms. And this quote is from Martin Luther King. We are faced, we are now faced with the fact that tomorrow is today. We are confronted with the fierce urgency of now. In this unfolding conundrum of life and history, there is such a thing as being too late. Let me stop here, thank you. So we only have uh, about 10 to 15 minutes uh, to try to unpack whether or not we're too late. And the first question I'm actually gonna ask is, uh, directly related to, uh, Room, what your last comments were, and I certainly would like all the panel to comment on this. The question is the following. This symposium is based on a 1.5 to 2 degree scenario, but the challenges described today make it clear that no significant progress will be made in the next 10 to 15 years. You can, you can first of all, answer whether you agree with that or not. Um, but here's the question. If technological slash commercial slash policy barriers are not conquered until 2035, so another 15, 15 years, aren't we looking at more than a two degree scenario? And if so, are the pathways we discussed today sufficient? Is this a reverse quiz to me? It is. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, I think, and I'll give you my personal, I think two degrees is kind of baked in, especially with the infrastructure and all that is there. I don't think we're moving fast enough and so we'll be extremely, extremely lucky, um, especially, you know, the economy is going, we want the economy to go strong. If the economy goes down because of coronavirus or something, I don't know, maybe we'll, our fuel consumption, energy consumption will go down, but we don't want that. So I think two degrees is kind of roughly baked in. Um, the, so the question is what do we do beyond two degrees we should be preparing the adaptation to three, three and a half um, in terms of water, drought resistant crops, agriculture, uh, livestock, um, and other air conditioning. Boy, the, the grid, whether that'll sustain. I mean, those kinds of, and sea level rise. So those adaptation issues are really important. Um, I, and I go back to John Deutsch, who has looked at this very carefully and has got a four pronged approach to this. It's one is mitigation, the adaptation is looking at geoengineering. We should be looking at options now, not that we have to implement these things, but at least do the research in this and to find out whether it is, the governance is worthy of, of discussion or not. But I think we have to look at this comprehensive because we are you know, unfortunately looking at you know, two and a half, three, three and a half degrees. We don't know exactly where. I don't think anyone can say for sure. So I, I would uh, like to offer one thing, and that is um, the problem seems so daunting that one could think, well, how are we going to manage all this carbon, all this uh, carbon output um, at the gigaton uh, 
per year scale. And um, what I would say is that um, in this particular case, there's one aspect that could be um, sa saving the equation, and that is that it is the geopolitics of carbon. So if you look at the at where that output uh, takes place, really you, as it stands now and as it could stand for the foreseeable future, you have uh, two large players that could agree to a massive overhaul of how we manage carbon. So we don't need everyone to agree. We need two players to agree. So <clears throat> in the original question about two degrees C, the trains left the station. There's no way we're gonna we're gonna hit it. And um, you know, uh, I've said this at uh, meetings at the IEA. Why don't you admit we're not gonna make two degrees C? But the international climate uh, people, they they won't say no. And so that's why you see these scenarios with all these negative emissions. And if I could say something about uh, going net negative, you know. We first got to get to net zero, and, and, and everything we said today is still important even if we miss two degrees C, because we got to get to net zero and stabilize somewhere. The, the, the lower we stabilize, the better off we'll be. Then the question is, will, once we get there, will we go net negative? And um, that will be up to the people to decide, you know, several decades in the future uh, when we get there. But just think what net negative means. It means that today, we can do a lot to keep the carbon out. It doesn't matter when the carbon goes in. It goes in today or 40 years from now, it's still up there. We can do a lot today at $10, $20, $30 per ton to keep it out so we don't have to, you know, so we can stabilize lower. Yet now we're going to be expecting future generations, our children, grandchildren, their children, to take it out of the air at hundreds of dollars a ton of CO2 or maybe even more. I mean, that's really unconscionable. Uh, in, in my mind. So people that make these scenarios with net negative and say we got to do this, they should be saying we've got to do it today as fast as we can because we're going to leave a mess for our kids and grandkids. Ruben, I'll pose this question to you. Using saline aquifers sounds like it may have unintentional ecological impacts. How do you address, uh, how do you mitigate any damage that may be caused by injecting carbon into these uh, environmental reservoirs? So the, the basic answer is these are, uh, these are uh, water reservoirs that would never, ever be used. So what is important is to um, uh, confirm that the CO2 will remain isolated in these reservoirs. The, intrinsic economic or ecologic value is uh, non-existent. What is, uh, of course, important is to make sure that the CO2 would not be fugitive CO2. And I've alluded to uh, what are the critical aspects that would have to be uh, tackled in that regard. And uh, one important one is uh, pressure mitigation, so overpressure mitigation. And that is something that, uh, no, is a, it's an engineering problem uh, that can, in my mind, be addressed. Howard, uh, you talked about uh, optimism with uh, uh, BECCS, so bioenergy with uh, carbon capture storage. Uh, the question that came in is, how do we deal with uh, depletion of cropland as we produce biomass for the purposes of using it for carbon capture? Yeah. So how do we? How do we? How do we? How do we deal with? Uh, uh, fertile land being depleted yeah. as a result of... Um, uh, so, so, I mean, there's a lot of land you can grow biomass on, which they call marginal land, not necessarily cropland today. In fact, we run our models. It's not really cropland we're eating into. It's like pasture land or, or, or other types of, uh, of, of land there. So, so, you know, the model we run has, has a lot of details, and we have a paper that's going to be coming out that, that will detail some of it. But... Um, it's not there, but one thing I mentioned is um, it, it depends really important on the uh, assumptions of these models is the productivity increase. So how the productivity increases with crop lands, so how much land they'll need, how much the productivity uh, increases for um, uh, biomass crops uh, becomes very, very important on how exactly far we can uh, push these things. <clears throat> 
A question came in about uh, the use of oceans. Rune, you said you were not gonna talk about oceans. <laughs> Uh, Ruben, you mentioned saline aquifers, but not oceans directly. Uh, so either one of you, um, can you comment on uh, what's known or what the challenges are with using oceans? Um, and the other question that came in along with that is, um, Arun, you talked about um, the natural cycle of being able to, to uh, turn over as much or capture as much carbon with uh, plants. So the question here is, why not just plant uh, additional trees since that's a, a well-proven and time-tested strategy? I mean, for the ocean, let me say that we did consider that. Um, we know that oceans are getting acidified. If you want to neutralize that, you need some basic alkaline things. But the cost of breaking rocks, alkaline rocks, and putting in the ocean is a lot. And the scale is just so much. The other thing is, you know, can you put some food material like iron, for example, and grow some algae, this is your field. Um, well, I, I think you can certainly do that. The question again comes up as, you know, what other unintended consequences would there be? It's a similar, very similar to geoengineering issues because it is, it will be at the geoengineering scale. Anything that we do at the gigaton scale will have some geoengineering effect, right? So that's the kind of thing that I think research is important to understand what could be done. But I think it's also really important to find out how what the, uh, through the research, the unintended consequences that we don't, can't perceive, and how would you do the governance of that? Because these are international issues. This is not a, just a domestic issue. So I think that's on the ocean front. On the other hand, we looked at not just growing trees, but crops. Mm -hmm. uh, because if you have a fully grown forest, frankly, the CO2 uptake is, net CO2 uptake is not that high. But we grow annual crops. We grow that for food. And if you could somehow have a co-benefit of growing more food, which we might need anyway for higher population, and, um, and also capture the CO2 and put, them, put that in the ground, I think that those kinds of co-benefits -benef are options we, we, could, we could pursue. Not to say that you know, that wouldn't have unintended consequences. So in our report, we also looked at the use of water. Can you get less water using seeds? And this is where science and technology comes in to figure out what that would be. So, uh, and, and all for that matter, fertilizers. Mm -hmm. Now there are companies that are trying to grow their own fertilizer, own, fix their own nitrogen in the roots and, in, and amplify that than what has been done in the past. So there's, I think it's a combination. I do believe that science and engineering and technology will play a very important role, but that's not the only role. Um, in this whole gamut. I don't know if you wanted to add anything on oceans. Um, no, I don't think Okay. <laughs> uh, so uh, one last question that uh, had come, came from the audience. Um, we've spoken a lot about science and technology, about the role of policy and, and the role of, of government in a little bit of the earlier panels in terms of driving technology. This question is, what should be the role of oil and gas companies in addressing the challenge of carbon capture and storage? I'll, I'll, oh, sure. Right, I'll start. So, I mean, a lot of the oil and gas companies today are, have fairly significant programs in uh, research for carbon capture and storage. Um, they have the technology that can really carry it out, especially uh, uh, the underground part of it. But also, they're producing a lot of the fuels um, you know, that, that are causing uh, the emissions. So uh, they, they have a, a, an ulterior reason that they need to clean it up, otherwise they, they'll eventually go out to business. So of course, you have the tension here, are they doing things for real, to, or just buying time and greenwashing? Uh, but my, you know, the people I work with in this company, these companies, which are not, you know, the top people, but the people I work with are very serious about finding solutions and working on this technology. And they're the one segment that's actually putting significant money into this uh, area uh, today. Yes, I would like to, I would like to second that uh, in, a, in the sort of strongest terms possible. I, I believe that there's a genuine effort to see themselves as part of the solution. And that is, that is a, a shift that I have seen uh, in my interactions with them over the scale of, let's say, a decade, from being 
um, from perhaps uh, tr trying to be, uh, take a step to the side to be in an integral part of the solution. And that is, as, as Howard just pointed out, a lot of the expertise resides also with them in the science and, and technology and engineering of the subsurface. So in that respect, having that, sh that uh, psychological shift of uh, considering themselves as part of the solution is, I think, um, an important and, and uh, influential one. The only thing I'll add is that, and I'll go back to the gigaton scale. If you really want to address the gigaton scale, you need gigaton scale industries to do this. And those can be counted on your fingertips. Oil and gas being one, and it's very important. You also need gigascale dollars, okay? So let's be honest, I mean, this is not gonna be cheap, but there could be money to be made if there's a price on carbon, not the only thing that needs to be done. But, and fortunately, at least today, the oil and gas companies compared to the renewable companies have a better balance sheet. It's just you know, plain and simple. They also are engineering companies at the end of the day. They're, they're in business, but they, if you look at the skill sets, uh, they have engineering companies. And frankly, right now, the shareholder pressure on these oil and gas companies is so high, especially uh, European oil and gas companies, that they have to move. I mean, this is, there's no option. They have to be energy companies. Now, if you go back in their history, you'll find that they have had some scars on their back mm -hmm. on trying to do solar. Trying to, so they are now pivoting. And the question is, depending on the company and their shareholders and all that, is how much they want to dial. But they'd have to move the dial. There's no question on that. And how much they do, because if they do completely today, their balance sheet goes away. Right, so it's that trade-off that they're trying to play, and it's uh, they're in a precarious position, frankly, if I think long-term. Not the stock market today and tomorrow, but long-term, they have to pivot, and, and the, the rate of pivoting really depends on the shareholders, and but they, the good thing is that right now they have the assets, uh, they have the skill sets, they have the financial, uh, you know, uh, at least the balance sheet, and they have, they know how to do things at scale. So I would say embrace them. Embrace them and enable them to shift in the right way, in the right direction. I'm gonna follow uh, Secretary Moniz's lead and give everyone an opportunity for a parting comment, uh, either a message that you wanna leave for the audience or perhaps a message you wanna leave uh, for policymakers in terms of what's something we should be doing um, to be able to bring about uh, these technological revolutions that we've been talking about. You wanna start, Mark? Why don't we start at the end? Okay. <laughs> what, what's your, what are your parting words? What's the, the message that I, you want to leave? I, I, th I think there's a lot of technology out there ready to go. We just need the policy in place to make the economics work. Very good. So I would second that. I would uh, say two things. Internalize, like really internalize the cost of carbon, which where internalization is different from subsidy. And to think of solutions both in terms of the shift of the energy system and deploy it as quickly and transition as quickly as possible, but do not forget about bridge solutions that we absolutely need if we're going to make a dent on climate change mitigation. And the last word? Well, the last word and the message is to the, the younger generation, because we are at a university and I'm assuming there are some MIT students watching. First of all, I wish I was an undergraduate freshman entering MIT right now. <laughs> this is because as an engineer, you want to look at, you want to solve problems. Well, you can't find a bigger problem than this one. And this has all the complexity that you can ever imagine. And so if I were a student, I said, oh my God, this is great. Um, I, I want to take on this challenge. I want to get not just MIT, but MIT and all the other universities around who are interested in this, bring them together, bring the industries together, you got some trillion dollar industries saying that they want to be carbon neutral or carbon free. Fantastic, but that's for them. How do we get the benefit of that elsewhere, right? So I would actually get, I, I wish I, the, some young freshman is listening to this and say that I want to start this movement where I want to get all the universities together, I want to get the companies together, and if Washington is not moving, fine, let's move. <laughs> 
because yeah. if you don't move, I think we'll be too late. Thank you all very much. Thank you.